Hello, welcome to another segment of D.B. Cooper Through the Lens of Logic. In the last video, we concluded with the third paradox, where the money uh, has to be in the bag, and the money can't be in the bag. And I said, it's very similar to the liar's paradox, where both of the conclusions can't be true simultaneously. One or both, they basically can't be true together. There's an incorrect premise somewhere, at least one. So this is what we're going to discuss today. We're going to look at this in closer detail. Now, I, as I stated in one of the other videos regarding uh, resolving a paradox, and I gave uh, three ways to resolve a paradox, I stated that usually a paradox will arise from some sort of error, some sort of uh, mistake or, or incorrect way of looking at things. Uh, oftentimes this will arise from uh, language or equivocation, is what I said. Uh, the third paradox also arises from an error, from a mistake. And that error is actually an assumption. And there's actually two assumptions that I made in the last series of videos uh, leading up to the third paradox. The, f the first one is a catch-22. I'm going to call it the catch-22 assumption. And it's a catch-22, which is precisely why I made the assumption. And the other assumption actually is the one responsible for creating the paradox. So the catch-22 assumption is, is basically the question of, did Cooper, when he, when he tied the bag, okay, so he has this money bag, right? And it's got a drawstring, and he cinches it tight. Well, when you cinch it tight, it's just going to close the opening from, say, like this, where you could put the money in. It's just going to cinch it down to a very small amount. Like if you ever wore a hood around your head, you know, like a hoodie, and you take the little cords and go like this, and the you know, it, it'll shrink down in. That's basically what we're talking about here. So as he's tying the money to his waist, or what presumably what he's doing, does he take the two uh, loops and does he knot them up, you know, several times, or does he just maybe once and then tie it, or does he just tie it on? And that's that's a good question. We don't know that. We'll probably never know that. But just if I were to answer that question logically or just thinking it through, I'd say, no, why, why, why would he do that? Why would he double knot it or triple knot it? And he might do one just to make sure that it was somewhat secure. He's not assuming that this money is coming detached from him in mid-flight, but uh, he is probably tying it to make sure that it doesn't come detached from him in mid-flight. So anyway, regardless, uh, we're going to ask, you know, did he, did he tie it or not? And if, here's what we can say. If the money is in the bag, it can't leak out of the bag until it gets on the beach. That's what we pretty much were able to conclude. And so if that bag is not tied in a knot, or double knot, triple knot, then when it hits the water or it hits the ground, there's a massive amount of energy at terminal velocity that's going to cause the money to pop out. So you're already having spillage immediately the minute it hits. Uh, and as it floats down the river, it's open and money presumably would be able to split out or, or, or come out and, and it would spread as it goes. Well, we know that didn't happen. So kind of reverse engineering it, if, the, if we're going to make the assumption that the money is in the bag, then we're going to have to also say that it's double knotted. This is a catch-22, uh, so that's why I had to make that assumption. So everything in the, in the previous videos included that, or incorporated that. So, I'm, in fo I'm forced to, to conclude that <laughs> Cooper would tie a monster knot on the bag, even though I think it's, un it's not logical that he would do that. And uh, so here we are left with the paradox where uh, money must travel in the money bag, money can't travel in the money bag. And uh, let's look at 
the conclusions in detail because let's look at this first one where the money has to travel in the bag. Why did, why did we conclude this? Basically, I was looking at the proximity of the bills uh, together and discussing the probability that they all got within this one square foot independently and nowhere else. And I said that the, the likelihood of that is just astronomically small. I mean, okay, three bills showing up independently in one square foot, that's one thing. But three showing up in one square foot and nowhere else, totally different situation. So I used the following slide, if you'll recall. Money found in proximity to each other. Likelihoods of stacks traveling independently, showing up the exact same spot, extremely small. Therefore, and here's my conclusion, the stacks did not travel independently. We can absolutely conclude that independent stack travel did not occur. And contraposition would say that the money actually traveled together. Uh, and, and that is a legitimate conclusion. That was my conclusion here in the slide. What is not legitimate is that the money was actually in the original money bag. Uh, in fact, my tentative conclusion here, highlighted in red, begs the question. It's the very definition of begging the question. This is an example of circular reasoning creating a paradox, because it's this tentative, tentative conclusion that I said, uh, which was actually a fallacy of begging the question, that actually created the whole money must travel and money must travel in the bag. The whole third paradox arose because I jumped to a hasty conclusion a conclusion that actually should have been in question. I should not have made that assumption that it would be in the bag. And uh, a similar flaw of logic has created the whole paradox matrix that we talked about. So, in summation, the only true conclusion we can reach about this money is that it did uh, not travel independently of each other. These three stacks cash that were found within this one square foot did not travel independent of each other. And that raises the big question, how did it travel together? And you'll see I answered that question in a snap judgment, which is why it's called begging the question. So the true question is, how did that money travel together? So here we see I have uh, revised our uh, paradox here. So it's, it's not quite so paradoxical. Money must travel together, and money can't travel in the money bag. So, removing the circular logic from my argument, these divergent conclusions don't really seem quite as divergent anymore. I mean, they still do if you want to view it through money has to be in the bag. But uh, if you remove that, if you look at this objectively, it doesn't look quite as intimidating as it did before. It certainly does raise the question of how that money managed to travel together and yet not in the bag. If it didn't travel in the money bag, then how did it travel together? You see, you start asking these questions, and if you can't escape the uh, very circular reasoning, you're going to be stuck. So, uh, if you can look at this objectively, if you can look at this objectively, you can find a hidden truth. So, all three paradoxes are in the realm of of these uh, not true con contradictions, like the one, like the one here, is not really a contradiction. Uh, remember, I said that there was three ways to solve a paradox, and the first two really dealt with n not really true contradictions, and the third way was a liar's paradox. So this is where we're actually getting to starting to resolve the paradox and. And that is what we're going to resume in the next videos. We are going to begin looking at the Cooper Paradox Matrix. We're going to look at all three of these so-called paradoxes and look at what must hold true to give us some kind of sense of how to solve this mystery. See you then.